Good morning, everyone. My name is Fernando Arteaga, and I am the academic director of the Penn Initiative for the Study of Markets at the Economics Department of the University of Pennsylvania. I want to welcome everyone to the Economic History of Latin America Open Online course. Our objective with this project is to provide a general introduction to the most recent literature on the economic history of Latin America and its contemporary development. We will focus on exploring the long run economic trajectories and on scrutinizing the historical patterns that have shaped our societies. We will discuss the many missed opportunities, their implications, and the challenges ahead. Latin America is very diverse, so it is nigh impossible to cover all of its aspects in a few lectures. Instead, we opted to focus on the common traits that unite the region, traits that are linked to a shared past or indigenous legacies, the colonial institutions, slavery, the economic dependency on a set of staple commodities, political fragmentation and fragile state capacity, the authoritarian regimes, and the many caudillo-led counter rebellions, just to name a few. We will follow a chronological order, starting with economic arrangements in indigenous societies before the arrival of Columbus, the economic organization in the colonial period, the economic and political consequences of independence, the challenges of the early 19th century, and the insertion of the new countries into a global economy, the protectionist and nationalist policies of the early 20th century, and the death crisis of the 1980s, and the populist challenges and the technocratic reforms of the 1990s. Before we move on, I want to introduce our core faculty team. Jesus Fernandez Villaverde, today's lecturer, is professor of economics at the University of Pennsylvania, and he's the director of the Penn Initiative for the Study of Markets. Ivan Luzardo Luna is the Barry Postdoctoral Fellow in Economics at the University of Pennsylvania. Angel Alvarado is the Latin American's Project Senior Fellow at the Penn Initiative for the Study of Markets. Felipe Valencia is an Assistant Professor of Economics at the Vancouver School of Economics at the University of British Columbia. I, Fernando Arteaga, will be the main moderator of the course, but also will act as a lecturer. Along with our core faculty, we will have invited speakers from leading universities and colleges in the United States, England, and Latin America. Our expert guests have made significant contributions to our understanding of the economic development of Latin America. We will introduce each of them at the start of the respective session. Before we start with the first lecture, I want to provide some organizational details. The classes will be taught in English, but we have interpreters translating them into Spanish and Portuguese. There is an option in the Zoom interface to change the audible language. We'll, we will also be live streaming the lectures on our main YouTube channel, which is at PIS low score pen, at P I S M low score T E N N. In addition, we will upload the lectures, slides, and other materials to the course webpage so you can consult them anytime. The classes will consist of a 60 to 75 minute talk and we will have 15 to 30 minutes to answer questions at the end. However, you can ask questions at any point during the talk. A question box in Zoom will allow you to do so. We would like to encourage you to ask and participate. What makes the course worthwhile is your participation. Without any further delay, I'm going to leave you with Professor Jesus Fernandez Villaverde, who will introduce the course by looking into what is Latin America and why its economic history matters to understand the present state of the region. Uh, thank you very much, Fernando. So let me uh, share my screen. And hopefully everyone can see the, uh, the slides and let me minimize this. Okay. So what we are trying to do in this online course is to give an overview of the economic development of Latin America, both from a contemporary and from a historical perspective. So let me start by discussing the object of our study. So what is in a name? Why do we call Latin America Latin? It's actually an interesting story. Latium is an area between the River Tiber and Mount Circeo, which includes Rome, in the center of what we call today Italy, over here. You see, you see Rome over here. This is the Tiber River. 
and this area was called Latin. And the inhabitants of that area were an Indo-European tribe called Latins. We are not 100% sure of why this name comes, but most likely it comes from a word Latus, which means a plain. Thus, Latins were nothing more than the people of the plain, the people that were living in this plain around Rome. And Latin was just the language spoken by the people from that plain. And as you probably know, Latin is not only the mother of Spanish and Portuguese and French, but also is closely related with many other languages all the way from Hindu in India to English. So how did we end up calling Latin America Latin? Well, this is a story that is actually quite recent. The first recorded use that we have of the term comes from a French writer, Felix Belli. And in 1856, he wrote an article in a magazine in France talking about the problems that were happening at that moment in the United States. Is, if you remember, this is very close to the start of the Civil War in the US. And he referred to North America as the Anglo-American or the English-speaking American. And he used the word Latin American probably to avoid use words like Spain or Iberian. At the moment, before 1856, most people will refer to what we call today as Latin America as Spanish America, but that will not include Portugal or Iberian America, and help French imperial ambitions in the region by somehow referring to Latin America as Latin, France belongs to that story. And Belli himself had actually quite personal economic interest as a promoter of a Nicaraguan Trasismian Canal, as an alternative to what was later the Panama Canal. But the person who really popularized the idea was Francisco Bilbao, this lad over here, who was a Chilean writer living in Paris at the time who on June 22, 1856, gave a talk to a group of South Americans living in Paris to protest against the US recognition of Walker's regime in Nicaragua. The US had promoted and supported different filibusters, which were groups of mercenaries and adventurers who were trying to take over several countries in Central America and the Caribbean, and the most successful for a while of those filibusters was Walker. And Latin Americans, or what was going to be known as Latin American at that moment, were quite unhappy about the situation. Interestingly enough, Francisco Bilbao's definition excluded Brazil, Mexico, and Paraguay. And the reason was that he thought that these countries, in the case of Brazil, because of the African descendants of much descendant of much of the population, Mexico and Paraguay, because of the heavy proportion of indigenous peoples within their populations, did not really belong to what he thought was the Latin race. And in fact, during the first decades, only people who were of Spanish, Portuguese, Italian, or French descent were called Latin Americans, but not those who were indigenous or descendants from Africans. The name really solidified as the way in which we refer to the region after World War II, in particular because the US started setting up academic institutions that used the word Latin America to refer to this region. So the modern definition of the region includes 20 republics plus a commonwealth. I'm not going to enumerate all of them, but in alphabetic order go from Argentina to Venezuela. And this is a map of the region from Wikipedia, where you can see that we are going to look at the whole area between Mexico to Tierra del Fuego. Now, this is an interesting definition because there are some subtleties to it. On one hand, we are including Haiti, which speaks French or Creole, which is a modification of French, a derivation of French. But on the other hand, we are going to exclude the French territories in the Caribbean, like Guyana, Guadeloupe, Martinique, uh, Saint Bartholomew and San Martin. Doesn't really matter that much because they have a small population, not even one million people. 
I always found though more fascinating that we are going to exclude territories south of Rio Grande, like the English and Dutch speaking Caribbean and Belize, and we are also going to exclude the French speaking North America, basically Quebec and Saint Pierre and Miquelon. And I could never find anyone who could explain me very well why Quebec was not part of Latin America, since they speak French, which in some sense is closer to Latin than to Spanish. Nonetheless, this is the definition that we are going to follow. I want to point out that this definition is not without its discontents. For instance, some scholars from the humanities have even denied the existence of, of a Latin America. Walter Mignolo, an Argentinian scholar at Duke, for many years have complained that the very same idea of Latin America is just the consequence of a colonial inheritance that the countries of the region should eliminate. Or others, perhaps more moderate, claim that the label is becoming increasingly obsolete. That it may have made sense to talk about Latin America in 1850, but that in 2023, many of the countries in the region have evolved in such different ways that try to think about them as a common set of countries is not the best way to approach it. Nonetheless, as you will suspect, given that we are teaching this class on the economic history of Latin America, we do not share this argument. We think that these arguments have a little bit of a point and that we should not completely disregard them, but that this is a common area that has sufficient points of contact that deserve to be studied. For instance, there are very strong interactions between all the member countries. Even if Mexico and Argentina can be very different, at the end of the day, Mexico and Argentina really have a lot of points in common. And this is very well seen by the fact that events and institutions are often highly synchronized across the region. We will see during the next 20 lectures how, when there has been changes in political economy or in economic structure in Argentina, those are often correlated with the same changes in Mexico. Not perfectly, but highly correlated. And a good example is this map of forms of government that I'm taking from Wikipedia. You see in blue are those countries that have a presidential system. In comparison, countries in red are countries that have a constitutional monarchy. Countries in orange are countries that have a parliamentary republic. That is a republic with a prime minister where the president of the republic doesn't really do much. And what is quite amazing and quite surprising is that you see that the only region in the world that has an overwhelming dominance of presidential regimes is Latin America, probably influenced by the example of the United States. Well, just this map tells you that we are talking about a region that has a lot of common aspects to it. Without further ado then, let me get into some of the main pattern of Latin American economies. The first thing I want to discuss is geographical patterns. I always emphasize the very high importance of uh, geographic issues. And in fact, geography is going to play an important role in this class. Latin America, as we defined it before, is a very large region. It has around 20 million square kilometers which is, as a way to think about it, nearly twice or a little bit more than twice the size of the United States. Mm. And a simple way... Yeah, I don't recall. So if you think about it, for instance, in this map, I'm just putting Brazil on top of the United States, and you can see how just Brazil occupies most of the United States and a big chunk of Brazil. That gives you a size, an indication of how large the region is. Also, a second and very important fact is the north-south orientation of the continent. So, for instance, here in this map, I'm plotting Argentina, Mexico, and Chile in comparison with the United States and Canada. And you can see how Chile, which is not a particularly large country in total size, is nonetheless extremely long 
in terms of north-south orientation. And it goes all the way from the north of Canada to Florida. Even Mexico goes, you know, if you compare the north of Mexico and the south of Mexico, is as much geographical distance as comparing Montana with Louisiana. And this will be important in part of the stories that we are going to tell you. Because historically, traveling north-south has been much harder than traveling east-west, in particular for issues such as the transmission or the diffusion of agricultural technologies. And that's going to be part of the reason why the Neolithic Revolution in the Americas is going to happen a little bit later than in other parts of the world. Also, Latin America is distant from, is distant from the course of Eurasia and North Atlantic. This is a map of flights in the wall where the size of the cycles refers to the intensity or to the number of flights in any particular airport. And you can see clearly there is a big core here in the United States, which you know, is pretty much the whole east and the southwest of the United States, the northern plains are a little bit more empty. You have the enormous concentration of Western Europe, and you have also the enormous concentration of East Asia. And Latin America, in particular the South, is quite distant for all, from all these three big hubs of transportation and economic activity. There is going to be what one Australian historian called the tyranny of the distance that is going to shape much of the economic history of Latin America. Remember, in particular, that before the arrival of the railroad and the Panama Canal in the late 19th century, it was extremely hard to travel within Latin America. And that some areas were surprisingly far away, such as Chile and San Francisco in the US, were more easily communicated thanks to sailing than the landlocked interior. And even to this day, many regions in Latin America do not have access to good infrastructure to communicate with the rest of the world. Also, Another very important geographical pattern of Latin America is the existence of what geographers call the American Cordillera, basically Sierra Madre Occidental, Sierra Madre Oriental, and the Andes, who create two distinctive sides of the continent. This is a map of the physical features of Latin America. You see here the two Sierra Madres, and pretty much without any solution of continuity, you get to all the Andean system and that is going to give you one part of the Americas, of Latin America, that is oriented to, towards the Pacific, and another part of Latin America that is oriented towards the Atlantic Ocean. And perhaps the easiest way to think about it is comparing Chile, which is a very Pacific country, versus Argentina, which is a very Atlantic-oriented country. They are surprisingly close but the existence of the Andes really makes these two countries have very different evolution over time. Or you could think in the same way about Peru on one side of the Andes and the other side of the Andes. There are three gigantic great river systems flowing from the Andes to the Atlantic, and the existence of these three big river systems is also going to shape much of the experience of Latin America. In particular, we are going to have the Amazon, the Paraná, and the Orinoco. So big are these three great river systems that Latin America accumulates 30% of the world's fresh water. There is also enormous climatic variation. Let me jump to this other map. You can look at it in detail in the slides, but you can see how we go from the desert areas in the north of Mexico and Baja California, and then we are going to have wet tropical areas humid tropical areas, and we are going to go all the way down again to west, to a very Mediterranean areas even, and to again deserts. So the enormous amount of climatic variation is also going to uh, be correlated with enormous bi biodiversity. We are going to have, this is vegetation zones of Latin America, areas of desert interpolated with areas of the rainforest, which is going to generate an extremely rich and diverse set of environments. And part of the challenges we are going to talk about Latin America in the 21st century is how to protect and rescue these areas from environmental degradation. 
And finally, the last aspect of geographical patterns that I want to highlight is the enormous amount of mineral resources in the area. From gold and silver that motivated European colonial empires to nowadays oil and maybe uh, resources such as lithium that are becoming more and more important in a world of electric cars. After geography, let's talk a little bit about demographic patterns. Who is in Latin America? In 2021, there is around 648 million people living in the region. Again, as a comparison with the US, it's about twice as many people in the US, so twice as many, twice as large in terms of population, twice as large in terms of size. That's kind of an easy way to remember the relation between Latin America and the United States. Of these 648 million, one third, nearly perfectly, 213 million live in Brazil. Brazil is the big demographic giant of the area. Although, and this is a point we are going to come back later on, this is a consequence of the fact that when the Portuguese colonial empire disappears, Brazil remains unified, while the Spanish-speaking areas or the parts that belong to the Spanish empire get fragmented. And this is a threat of political unification in Brazil versus political fragmentation in Spanish-speaking America that we will return to often in this class. After Brazil, we have Mexico with 126 million, Colombia with 51 million, and Argentina with 45 million. And if you sum all these four countries, that gives you around two-thirds of the population of the area. Fernando emphasized in the introduction that being an enormously diverse continent, we need to highlight more commonalities than differences. But when we highlight some concrete examples, Brazil, Mexico, Colombia, and Argentina will appear a little bit more often just because of their demographic size. That doesn't imply in any way, shape, or form that we don't care about the experience of smaller countries like Guatemala or Honduras. It's just that larger countries are um, maybe a little bit of a better way to explain the story that we want to uh, highlight. Also, it's an area that is extremely highly urbanized. 82.7% of Latin Americans live in cities. And when we think about cities, we think about very large metropolis as such as Sao Paulo, Mexico, or Buenos Aires. In fact, the level of urbanization in Latin America is the highest in the world, ahead of North America and Europe, which is something that, by the way, goes all the way back to colonial times, where there was already a lot of uh, urban structures, a very rich urban structure, and that has also shaped part of the economic structure of Latin America. And also, it's a population that is very concentrated on the coast. So looking here, and the population density of Latin America, you see, for instance, over here, Buenos Aires, Montevideo, Sao Paulo, Rio, and Recife, etc., with a big part of the continent with very, very low levels of population settlement. And I have traveled through the Patagonia, and it's very salient when you go in that area that is really very few people living over there. Also, it's an area that is experimenting a swift demographic transition. And if I may say so for just one second, this is one of the aspects that I find the most important about the next 25 years of the Latin American economies and something that I'm afraid a lot of economists do not have in their head. The current fertility rate in Latin America, that is the number of children that a woman has on average in her lifetime is 1.86 which is well below replacement rate, which is around 2.1 to 0.15. Why is this so interesting? First of all, because as recently as 1960, the fertility rate in Latin America was 5.9. So we have reduced fertility by two thirds in just 60 years. And not only we are in 1.86 right now, it is falling really, really fast. There has been no country in the history of humanity, where fertility has undertaken such a fast decline as Guatemala and Honduras 
over the last 10 years. Just look at the numbers of Honduras and Guatemala, you will be amazed. I'm not sure a lot of policymakers in the region are really thinking very carefully about this issue. In fact, the population of Latin America will start decreasing around 2040. The population of Cuba and Uruguay is already falling. And the population of some of the big metropolitan areas, such as Buenos Aires, is already falling. The natural growth, what is happening in Buenos Aires is as it's still people from outside Buenos Aires moving into Buenos Aires, but a lot of the area is already so below fertility rate that population is shrinking. And by 2040, this is going to include the whole, the whole area. Also, it's an area that has very strong migration flows, both within Latin America, I was mentioning before, from the countryside to the city, or in these days, from instance, there is a big migration from Haiti into many other countries, or from Venezuela into Peru or Colombia, but also with respect to the United States, which have always been the big recipient of Latin American immigrants, and to a smaller degree, Western Europe. Let's think after describing who lives in Latin America, some of their characteristics. <clears throat> so Latin America is probably the most homogeneous area in the world, linguistically speaking. Spanish is the native language of around 62% of the population. Portuguese is the native language of around 32% of the population. So right there, you have 96% of the population, more or less, or sorry, 94% of the population, more or less, who just speak two languages. And I know that my Portuguese or Brazilian friends get unhappy when I mention this, but Spanish and Portuguese are among the two most similar languages out there in the world. For any Spanish speaker, reading Portuguese, even if you have never taken a class, is extremely easy. And Watching a, a movie in Portuguese really only requires a couple of weeks of living in Portugal or Brazil before your ear gets used to it. There is also a presence of indigenous languages, which I want to highlight. The, these indigenous languages are the native language of around 4% of the population. The most important are Guarani, with around 6.5 million native speakers. Southern Quechua with also around 6 million native speakers, Natual in Mexico with around 2.7 million native speakers. There are very few monolinguals left. Um, perhaps 3 million? It's hard to tell because the numbers are not very good about it. That's a big change with respect to as recently as 50 years ago, where there were many, many more monolinguals left as a proportion of the population. And then we have the small group of French slash Haitian Creole that is the native language of around 2% of the population. And again, if you think that French is quite related with Spanish and Portuguese, you find that except for the indigenous languages and the fact that there are very few monolinguals left, we really have a very, very homogeneous region in linguistic terms. And yet, and this is what I find one of the most fascinating observations about Latin America, is that politically, ethnically, and culturally is quite heterogeneous. And it's going to be quite heterogeneous between countries. So Uruguay is a very different country than Guatemala, despite the fact that Spanish is the main language in both countries. But it's also going to be countries that are going to have very big differences within them. And we will come back to that point several times, even today. So for instance, think about the comparison of Rio Grande do Sul with Bahia. Yeah, I spent some time in Bahia in my life when I was in college. It's a, a beautiful town, really fascinating, but it's really very different from Rio Grande do Sur. So let's move now to uh, highlight some of the main economic patterns. And the first thing that we would like to highlight is that Latin America has a similar set of endowments as North America or Australia. It has a very high land to labor ratio and an extreme abundance of natural resources. I mentioned before that Latin America has as twice as many people living in there as the United States and is twice as large. So the land to labor ratio is about the same. And this was historically even more so because the population in Latin America for most of history was quite small. <clears throat> 
And yet, North America, United States and Canada, and Australia have had a very different pattern of growth. While the United States, Canada, and Australia are among the richest economies in the world right now, Latin America is a mid-income region. So this is a map from the IMF where you can see in different colors the different levels of GDP per capita, already controlling for purchasing power parity. That is, by controlling by differences in the price levels. And you can see how most of Latin America is in light green, which means being a middle income region. Only Chile is in dark green, which means entering into the high rich region of Western Europe, Australia, the United States, and Canada. And you have a few in orange, in light orange, which means like low middle income, like Bolivia, Venezuela, or Peru, and a lot of Central America. Why is also this middle income? Because on the other hand, we don't see much of this dark orange and red that we see in Central Africa, which is the poorest region in the world right now. So Latin America is a region of middle income countries. But it's also a region of middle income countries that has a long history of undertaking periods of stagnation. And this is the current one that we are undertaking since 2008. These are maps of income uh, uh, graphs, excuse me, of GDP per capita, again in PPP terms, for the three largest economies of the region, Brazil, Mexico, and Argentina. And you can see that the income per capita of Argentina right now is pretty much in the same level that it was around 2005. Mexico has done a little bit better, but not particularly better. And Brazil also seems to be pretty much at the same level than 2008. And I think that part of the reason why we are seeing more and more political conflict and political uh, polarization in Latin America now that maybe 15 or 20 years ago is precisely linked with this current long period of stagnation. It's also a region of very high inequality. And the guest lecture that we are going to have on Thursday is going to spend a lot of time talking about inequality. So let me not repeat what Adriana will tell us. But to me, this is a photograph that has been shown in many reports of a city in Brazil where you see on the right this beautiful apartment building with these gorgeous pools in each of the terraces and tennis court and a big pool over there. And then right on the other side, you see these very substandard housing units. This, to me, is the perfect summary of Latin America inequality. Now, when does this inequality appear? And is inequality along many different dimensions? These are just going to be inequality of income. Well, there are two theories out there in the literature. One theory says that Latin America was already incredibly unequal in the colonial times and an independence time. The other argument says that, yes, there was inequality in colonial times, but that inequality was not extraordinary if you compare Latin America with other colonial empires, with other areas controlled by the European colonial empires. And that Latin American high levels of income inequality really spike during the second half of the, 20th, of the 19th century and early 20th century with the export-led boom. Fortunately, inequality seems to have been declining during the 20s, during the uh, recent 20 years. And again, we are going to come back to many of these ideas and talk about inequality. The third thing is the enormous dependence that historically Latin America has had on commodities under price fluctuations. So think about being a Latin America country that exports wheat or Latin American country that exports sugar. And then the price of sugar goes up and goes down. That really determines the patterns of your behavior. Think about Cuba, for instance, a country I have been reading quite a lot over the last uh, few weeks, and how the fluctuations in the price of sugar determine much of the history of Cuba over the last 150 years. Also, and this is the fourth point that I want to highlight, is that Latin America has missed the great boom that was globalization. And to me, this is one of the most striking figures I can think of. 
In blue, I have data from the World Bank of Argentina, GDP per capita, and again in PPP. We are always going to do everything in PPP terms. And in red, we have South Korea. In 1960, Argentina had seven times the income per capita from South Korea. So let me repeat it so it sinks. Seven times. In 1960, South Korea was so poor that in a famous, in a famous report by the World Bank, the World Bank said pretty much wrote off uh, South Korea. The World Bank said South Korea is so beyond redemption, it does not have a future that we are not even going to lend money to South Korea because there is no point. Okay, South Koreans pretty much can drop dead because there is nothing we can do about them. We fast forward by the late 1980s, South Korea overtook Argentina in income per capita. And if we fast forward to 2020, what you see is that South Korea is nearly three times as rich in income per capita. The income per capita is three times higher than Argentina. So we have gone from seven times ahead of South Korea, if you are from Argentina, to three times below South Korea, a change of 21. Why is this the case? If you think that globalization was not good for poor countries, then how do you explain South Korea? What was in South Korea that allowed South Korea to take advantage of the opportunities that the world economy offered from 1960 onward, but not Argentina? I will bet that many of you have a South Korean made phone, like a Samsung or a tablet or a TV. And some of you may even have a Hyundai or some South Korean car or no friends or relatives that drive as a, a South Korean car. I will be quite surprised if any of you have an Argentinian made cell phone. Okay, so that's a little bit kind of the situation of where, Argent of where Latin America is now. But remember what we have done. We have talked about the geographical patterns. We have talked about the demographic patterns. We have talked about the main economic patterns. Now, this course is going to be about the historical evolution of Latin American economies. So what I'm going to do over the next 20 minutes or so is give you a brief summary of what we are going to discuss. I'm going to do this because of two reasons. First, because maybe some of you do not have a lot of background on the area and having the main outline of what is going to happen later will help a lot to follow the next lectures. The second reason is because even those of you who have some background in Latin American economies may be more of a specialist on your particular country. Let's say you're from Peru, you may know very well what happens with Peru, but you may be a little bit more shaky about what happened with Mexico. And one of the themes of this course is precisely the global and interrelated aspects of the Latin American experience. I'm going to give some books for those who want to learn more. Now, I'm very much on purpose going to cite books in English. And the reason is we have a lot of people from Brazil, and we have a lot of people from Spanish-speaking America, and we have quite a few people from the United States, and a few people from Western Europe. Thus, I'm not going to assume that the average person speaks Spanish, which, as you can tell from my own accent, is my native language. But if you are interested in books in Spanish about particular parts of this area, please let me know, email either Fernando or me, and we will be glad to provide you with bibliography in Spanish. We are not going to be able to, pro maybe to produce such a great bibliography in Portuguese. I read Portuguese without any problem, and I have a fair amount of books in Portuguese, but I need to recognize I control or I'm a little bit less on top of the Portuguese uh, literature. But, you know, if you, if you are still interested in Portuguese, let me know and I will try to do my very best. So a couple of standard textbooks that will give you a general background of the history of the region in English are Modern Latin America by Smith and Green and A New History of Modern Latin America, Clayton, Conniff and Gauss. 
These two books summarize what I'm going to call, quote unquote, the mainstream or the consensus view on the history of modern Latin America. It's not that I agree with everything in the consensus view or the mainstream view. I differ from their analysis in important aspects, and I'm happy to talk about those, but I think it's always fair to give the mainstream view to the students and then let the students decide by themselves in which aspects they want to diverge from the mainstream view. In terms of economic history, unfortunately, there's not a lot out there. And in fact, part of the reason that motivate Ivan, Felipe, Angel, Fernando, and myself to organize this course last year was our unhappiness with the existing textbooks on American economic history, Latin American economic history. In English, you have Victor Wilmer Thomas, An Economic History of Latin America Since Independence, and it's in the third edition. You can already see from the title what the problem is. This is since independence, and something that Fernando is going to try to convince us is that the indigenous inheritance in Latin America is absolutely crucial. So we really want to understand how the region looked like when the Europeans arrived. And we also really want to understand colonial times. There is, in Spanish, this is one of the few books I'm going to cite in Spanish, just because there is nothing much more than Bulmer Thomas in English, El Desarrollo Económico de América Latina desde la Independencia by Bertola and Ocampo. And again, it suffers from the same problem. It focuses on the independence. Also, both books were written a few years ago, and academia moves, scholarship evolves, and perhaps some of the most recent and exciting ideas in the field have not been fully incorporated into the text. Okay, so let me then do this crash course. This will be a little bit, you know, what is the absolute bare minimum that I want to know about the economic history of Latin America? And let's start with the pre-Columbian era. The most salient aspect of pre-Columbian era is that by 1492, the whole of the Americas was divided into different zones with very different levels of state formation. This is a map where you can see, for instance, in dark red, the areas of what I'm going to call state-based civilizations. Those were areas where the level of social complexity had evolved enough to create complex states. Now, the word complexity here is going to be used in the sense of entropy, of having a lot of a structure. It's not used in any normative way. By normative, I mean not because you are complex, you are better, and not because you are simpler, you are worse. I think it's one of the traditional mistakes of historians not now, but at least 50 years ago, was to equate more complex with better. So we are not making that statement over here. But basically, you have the Mesoamerican civilization with both the Mayans and then later what I'm calling here the Triple Alliance of Mexico, Tenochtitlan, Texcoco, and Chacopan. I don't like to use the Aztec Empire names, kind of a not very accurate. And also, of course, you have the Incan Empire of the Indian civilization go all the way from what is today Chile to the south of Colombia. In a little bit lower levels of state formation, you have what historians often call the chiefdoms, what were a little bit of intermediate forms between villages and fully fledged states. And you can think about the Amazonian chiefdoms, the North Indian chiefdoms in today's Colombia, and in North America, the Mississippian Mount Builders and the Iroquois Confederation. Then you have village farming peoples that control or that were extended over much of what is today Brazil and the Caribbean area. area. And finally, you have the hunter-gathering peoples that have not transitioned through what is usually known as the Neolithic Revolution, which is the adoption of agriculture and husbandry as the main sources of calories for the diet and the settlement in permanent or quasi-permanent villages. And that was here in the savannah and the Pampas areas and in the north of what is today Mexico, and of course a lot in what was later North America. 
And you can probably already see why it was pretty much from the beginning going to be the case that what happened when the Europeans, in this case, the Spaniards arrived to Latin America and they encountered the Mesoamerican civilization and the Indian civilization is going to be different than when the British arrived to North America where they don't encounter any of these more complex states. In fact, even the Mississippian mound builders seem to have been in a process of social decomplexification right before the arrival of the Europeans, and we are not quite sure of why that happened. Maybe it was because of some level of environmental de deterioration. And as I want to highlight, we had plenty of intermediate cases. And if anything, we are learning more and more about the rich complexity of the Americas before the European arrival. So this is an area of research that is very exciting, very important, and that has really helped us to think in very novel and challenging ways about Latin America before the Europeans arrive. And this is, of course, just a map from the Florex Codex, I think, a Florentian Codex from uh, Tenochtitlan, when, you know, this is the flag of the Spanish of the Habsburg Empire, uh, and how sophisticated and extremely complex the whole area was in what is today Mexico City. In fact, by 1492, around half of the Americas, of the Americans, and here I'm considering the whole Americas from Alaska to Tierra del Fuego, already live in complex state formations. And around three fourths of them have gone through the Neolithic revolution. So don't think about what you watch in some old Hollywood movies about the Americas as hunter gatherers. No, three quarters of Americans, of indigenous people have already settled down in agriculture and settled villages. In fact, the region was undertaking, undertaking a very, very fast transformation. And had the Europeans not arrived in 1492, the Americas will have looked very, very different in 1592. The influence of the Mesoamerican civilizations and the Indian civilizations were extending very quickly, and the whole area was going through a process of consolidation. And as we will discuss, part of the reason this process of consolidation is a little bit later than in other areas of the world is because of the north-south geographical axis that we discussed before that slowed down the diffusion, for instance, of corn, maize, and other agricultural technologies. And that very diverse structure of the Americas before the arrival of the Europeans is why we are going to observe very diverse economic structures. Some of the economic structures are going to be very highly hierarchical and unequal, while other economic structures are flatter and more equal. And also remember that at that time, there was no sense of a common identity. So have you asked in 1492 about someone here living in the Iroquois Confederation about you know, the Pampas hunters gatherers, they will have thought about them as completely different. People. And even if genetically they are quite close, what I want to highlight is this enormous diversity within Latin America. And yes, of course, what we know is what happened next is the arrival of Columbus and the Spanish, and then later the, um, the Portuguese and other European powers. And this is going to lead to a very rapid conquest, in particular Cortés of the Mesoamerican area and Pizarro of the Indian area. And this process of conquest is also something that Fernando will explain to us. We have changed the way we think about it over the last 25 years. We used to think about as this very violent, and indeed it was very violent process where the Spaniards come and take over. But what we have learned is that the conquest is actually followed by a period of accommodation with endogenous elites. And that's the only way, in fact, the Spanish and the Portuguese were able to control their very vast territories. Remember, as I mentioned in the next bullet point, that only around 1,500 Spaniards and Portuguese arrived per year to the Americas. And if you take out the ones who died because of diseases, you realize that the amount of European immigration during colonial times is actually very small. Most of the immigration to the Americas from Europe is actually going to be a 19th and 20th century phenomenon after independence. 
And it's through this accommodation with endogenous elites that we are going to find a kaleidoscopic mixing of populations and cultural fusion that yields the unique culture, for instance, that is Brazil with an African, an indigenous, and a European component. Of course, this mixing of population and cultural fusion is based, as I was mentioning before, on an enormous amount of violence, dislocation, and suffering. There is a catastrophic drop in indigenous populations, perhaps 75%, some scholars say maybe more, maybe as high as 90%, although I tend to believe it's a little bit more in the 75, 80% amount, mainly derived by the arrival of infectious diseases against which indigenous peoples didn't have natural immunity. And of course, we are also going to have the arrival of enslaved Africans. You want to really, really remember the history of migration into the Americas before independence is the history of forced, coerced, enslaved Africans being carried to the Americas. It's not the story of Europeans arriving to the Americas. And finally, another important aspect of this European settlement is the very important or fundamental role played by cities. It's a very urban center colonization. So Spaniards will arrive to the region and create a big square and have a city hall, a cathedral, and a university, because that's what they remember from Spain. And that's why some of the oldest of the oldest universities in the Americas are actually well before universities in North America, well before Harvard or Princeton or Penn are founded. We have the universities in Santo Domingo, in Mexico City, and in Lima. After quite a bit of evolution, the Spanish empire on the F of, if of independence is going to be organized around four vice royalties plus several captaincies. So you are going to have over here New Spain, which by the way, includes most of the west of the United States as far north as Vancouver, where Vancouver is today, there was a Spanish fort. I always like to tell that to my Canadian friends. Then you are going to have the Vice Royalty of New Granada, which includes what today will be Venezuela, Colombia, and Ecuador. And then you have the Vice Royalty of Peru and Rio de la Plata. And then the Brazilian Empire is organized in the Vice Royalty of Brazil, also with smaller divisions. This division of the Spanish Empire on the eve of independence in different vice royalties and captaincies is going to be the kernel, the seed of later political fragmentation. The colonial economy was very centered around commodities. We already mentioned that before. So think about, for instance, the production of silver, the production of gold, and sugar production. And it is the arrival of Europeans to the Americas and the creation of a commodity export economy that is going to create an integrated world economy. The arrival of silver into Western Europe is going to eventually get to China and it's going to have large consequences in the monetary policy of China. But even at a little bit more anecdotal way, if you go to a Chinese restaurant, you will notice that a very important part of the Chinese cuisine involves peanuts and chilies. Well, both peanuts and chilies are from the Americas originally. Without the process of colonization, China will look very different from the way China looks today. And that's again something we don't tend to think about. Okay? We don't tend to think about how Latin America and the process of colonization had an impact that went way beyond what we have in mind. Also, we will tell, because this is going to be important for later to understand the economic, the political economy of Latin America, the complex political structures that existed related to the import of municipios, the local adaptation of these Spanish institutions, and how the Iberian monarchies were always searching and often failing for ways to assert their power. Why? Because the local elites design nuanced strategies to reassert their powers and autonomy from Madrid and Lisbon. And these strategies are going to be aggravated 
after the Bourbon reforms, which we are going to spend some time explaining in detail, and the conflict between peninsulares, administrators and civil servants that had been born in Spain or in Portugal and the criollos, the local elites, especially after one fundamental moment in the history of Spanish America, which is the capture of Havana by the British in 1762 during the Seven Years' War, and the awareness of the sudden awareness within the Spanish monarchy of the need of introduce deep reforms. These reforms are also going to generate tensions within ethnic groups as the Tupac Amaru rebellion between 1780 and 1783. And this is going to lead after quite a long of events. And again, I'm skipping a lot because this is just a brief introduction to the process of independence. Around 1810, Latin America has around 25 million people. And again, these numbers are important because it helps you to put things in perspective, okay? So remember now, 650 million, 200 years ago, it was 25 million. So we are talking about a multiplication by a factor of nearly 23. Of those 25 million, 15 million were indigenous. So Latin America and the F of independence is still a very, very heavily indigenous society. There is around 3 million people of European descent, around 2 million people that are slaves of African descent, and around 5 million people of mixed heritage. With the unusually high level of urbanization that I was mentioning before. The elites in Latin America and even the middle classes are going to be deeply impressed by the US revolution, which I'm dating here to 1765, which is when the constitutional conflict starts, even if the revolutionary war only starts in 1775. And of course, the Haitian revolution in 1795, which is the largest revolt of enslaved people in history and in some sense, the most successful. And again, we are going to discuss some of these issues, but the Napoleonic invasions of Spain and Portugal are going to generate the independence wars between 1808 and 1826. Now, the independence wars are going to generate this type of independent America with things like the United Provinces of La Plata or the Gran Colombia. But at the same time, we should not forget that there are going to be large exceptions. In particular, Cuba and Puerto Rico are going to be Spanish possessions until 1898. And the very peculiar history of Cuba is going to have, during the Cold War, a large impact in the rest of Latin America. We will try to explain or best the economic history of the independence process sufficient to say over here that you want to keep in mind two main ideas. First, the extreme variety of circumstances, because what Hidalgo does in Mexico is really very different to what he tries to accomplish than what San Martin in Argentina had in his mind. And again, as I was mentioning before, we have the big difference between the unity of Portuguese America and the fragmentation of Spanish America. Independence leads to a process both of civil wars and state building with very deep constitutional differences. For instance, there are going to be deep differences about do we want to have a very centralized system of government where power is concentrated on a capital? Or do we want to have some federalist societies where power is divided between different provinces? What is the relation we want to have in terms of the interaction between the Catholic Church and the state? And those are going to be behind many of the civil wars I was mentioning. But from an economic perspective, the four main ideas that you want to keep in mind is, first, that there is going to be a break from traditional trade linkages. The traditional ways in which, for instance, shoes were produced in Lima, in Peru, and exported to Colombia is going to be broken by the independence process and the fact that Gran Colombia and Peru are going to be two different nations. And that's going to lead to a very high level of market fragmentation. Not only we are going to have market fragmentation, which is going to really slow down economic progress in the whole region during the 19th century, we are going to have the end of fiscal and monetary unions. At the end of the day, the Spanish and the Portuguese empire were also fiscal and monetary unions, 
with large transfers within the regions. That union is going to disappear and it's going to lead to many problems, both in terms of being able to operate payment systems and in terms of being able to run a government budget in ways that are going to be efficient. And that's why, if anything characterizes 19th century Latin America, is widespread sovereign defaults. This is a list of all the um, is table two. Uh, I'm sorry, it's a little bit small, but hopefully you can see it in your own copy of the slides. You can see how Argentina, just the first row, is spending 90, in 1826, 98% of its budget on military issues. And even as late as Peru in 1865, still 71% of the government budget is military aspects. Okay, and I was mentioning defaults. This is our numbers from Taylor. You can see here in dark the number of countries that in Latin America that are in any given moment in default. And also this is the countries in default country by country. You can see that Colombia spends 49% of the time between 1825 and 1914 default, Honduras 79%, Mexico 57%. Even the best performance like Uruguay are still 12%. And part of it is because they just didn't issue any bonds for the longest time, okay? So these are really, you know, I also have here details. I'm not going to go over them in the interest of time, but these are really times of widespread sovereign defaults, which is going to, shape the financial markets in the region in ways that still matter today a lot. And these very unfavorable economic conditions with the break from traditional break trade linkages, the market fragmentation, the end of fiscal and monetary unions and sovereign defaults are going to feed back into political uncertainty, which is going to lead to more civil wars, which is going to lead into worse economic performance. So, you know, the first few decades after independence are, economically speaking, not great times for Latin America. Things start to change in the late 19th century when we start seeing an economic takeoff based on export-led growth. And like all the examples of export-led growth, there is going to be positive things and there is going to be negative things. In this course, we want to be very nuanced and really highlight that the history of Latin America is not black or white, but full of grace. Latin America is going to be a large, a large exporter of sugar, coffee, wheat, bananas, copper, beef, rubber, nitrates, tin, and silver, among many others. And part of it is because of the very good terms of trade that existed at the time. Let me show you, for instance, oops. I think I skip, uh, well, I miss it, but I'll, um, the terms of trade, sorry, I, I used to have a slide on the terms of trade that uh, I seem to have deleted by mistake. But basically the terms of trade for Latin America are very positive at the time. And these very positive terms of trade really incentivize the exports. Latin America also becomes a very large destination of foreign domestic investment, mainly, but not only, from the UK and the US. And this is the table with British investments in Latin America at the end of 1880. And you can see these are very, very large numbers. And much of it is going to be linked with railroads and mines. And again, we are going to tell a story that is going to be nuanced between the importance of railroads and mines and the good things about this and the bad things about this investment. Also, a very important aspect of the story of Latin America during the 19th century is the scattered abolition of slavery. Independence begins with very positive and optimistic views about eliminating slavery, but unfortunately, it lingers as late as 1886 in Cuba and in Brazil in 1989, which is the last Western country to have abolished slavery. There is also an overlooked tradition at that time of democracy and constitutionalism. Many countries in the region are able to get rid of the caudillos, and even authoritarian regimes like the Porfiriato in Mexico are going to quote-unquote pretend to be democratic. 
And it's this tradition of democracy and constitutionalism that many people in Latin America is going to be able to borrow in the late 1950s and later in the 1980s to improve the democratization of the region. After the export-led boom, the period between 1914 to 1945, 1970 is going to be very different. There is going to be the enormous shock of the Great Depression between, of course, World War I and World War II, which are shocks in themselves, that is going to lead to a process of accelerated deglobalization in the area, in the world, and is particularly affecting Latin America. The Cold War is going to be times that are going to be very difficult, politically speaking. There is going to be the populism, Getulio Vargas, Perón, etc., the revolution in places like uh, Cuba, and military authoritarianism, like the military juntas, I'm just pointing out there, Argentina, or la violencia in Colombia. Economically speaking, it's going to be a process, or it's going to be a period, that is going to be focused around import substitution, industrialization, and inward development, our nationalist-based economic policies. Although, this is very important to recall because I find that often even Latin Americans are not aware of this fact. Latin America was already the most protectionist region in the world by the late 19th century. In fact, countries with the highest tariffs in the 19th century tended not to be the countries that did very well in terms of regional average. This is a graph about the average by Williamson, about the average tariffs in the world before World War II. Latin America is over here with the crosses, and you can see that after 1885, it overtakes the United States, which has been quite protectionist after the Civil War. The Civil War is the victory of the Republican Party. The Republican Party was very protectionist at the time. And how by 1885, Latin America is already by far the most protectionist part of the world. So yes, import substitution and inward development are going to be very salient features of the post-World War II um, experience of Latin America, but those are building on a long and historical process of protectionism that goes much back in time. Let me skip some of the extra slides in the interest of time. Then we are going to have the return to democracy in the 1980s, Remember that by 1978, only three countries in Latin America were democracies, Costa Rica, Colombia, and Venezuela. You always have to deal exactly with what Mexico was in 1978 with the pre in power. So let me call it an intermediate case. By 1994, only Cuba was not a democracy. So it's really a gigantic change in 16 years. And no military officer on active duty has served as president in Latin America since 1990. So the, the era of uh, military coups seems to be behind us. But of course, we still have the debt crisis of the 1980s, which led to the so-called uh, lost decade, the partial economic liberalization in the 1990s, and the big economic boom. Let me conclude by talking a little bit about the troubles ahead, and then we can have some questions and answers. The first thing, that comes to mind when we think about the Latin American economy is low productivity. There are few multinationals. If I stop an average person in the United States or in France and I ask them, you know, name one Latin American multinational, no one is going to be able to come up with a name. We have, you know, Pemex or Petrobras related with uh, oil, but pretty much there are no large multinationals from Latin America. And there is very little technological innovation. If you look at any measure of research and development, Latin America is quite behind. There is going to be a very, very, and by the way, the lecture on, on Thursday will elaborate on one a lot. Okay, so there is much more coming about that. Informality. So informality is workers that are not in the formal economy with you know, all the paperwork done properly. Latin America has on average a level of informality of over 50%, which in addition to it has a partial gender component, which is very different from other areas of the world. Look here in Bolivia, you get as many as 75% of workers. And that has huge consequences, for instance, about our ability to provide social services. It's an area also that has very, very persistent 
high inequality. And again, this is going to be part of the arguments that we are going to discuss on Thursday or guest lecturer will discuss on Thursday. And it has very high inequality in terms of income, in terms of wealth, and in terms of education, as well as very low social mobility. Although fortunately, poverty rates are improving. These are data from the Inter-America Development Bank. And you can see how the poverty rate, people living with less than $5.5 a day, which is really very, very little, has been dropping a lot. And how the middle class has been growing a lot. Okay, So a lot of inequality, but at least extreme poverty seems to be doing now a little bit better. It's also an area that has very large regional and ethnic disparities. Again, using data, this is about educational disparities. Let me skip that. You can see, for instance, let me focus on countries like Argentina or Brazil. If you look at how much is the income in Corrientes of a household versus the city of Buenos Aires, you see a difference of more than three times. To give you an idea, there are very few European countries where this difference is as large as two. Italy is probably the most extreme case, and it's around two. So in Argentina, you have three. Or between Maranhão and the federal district in Brazil, the difference is five times. Okay, So enormous amount of regional inequalities within Latin American countries. And also quite important inequalities in terms of ethnic origin, people of African descent, which usually in Latin America are called Afro-descendants, have incomes by 2017 that are still 20% below the average. And in terms of indigenous population, again, we have differences of around 30% on average. Of course, with heterogeneity, countries like Chile is doing better than Bolivia, but nonetheless, very big, important differences in these populations that I think a society should try to address a little bit more systematically. We also have a region that has very, very troubling challenges of an aging population, as I was mentioning before. Remember, by 2040, the region may be losing population al already. The challenges of energy transition, we need to decarbonize our economy. And this is both in terms of users, you know, how are we going to decarbonize the use of energy in Latin America, but also as exporters of energy. You know, think about Venezuela or Mexico, but in particular, Venezuela is a main exporter of oil. What is Venezuela going to do in a world that is not going to use oil anymore because we are going to transition to a net zero emission of CO2? It's a region that has very high crime. And this is interesting because we as economists, we don't talk about that. And this is a very important thing. This is a map from Wikipedia on countries by intentional homicide rate and you see these very dark colors over here of Mexico, of Brazil, of Venezuela, of Colombia, as regions that have incredibly high homicide uh, rates. And uh, you know this has serious consequences for economic activity. Also, the fact that there is a slow and unreliable judicial systems. And again, I have some graphs over here about you know how you know places like Guatemala or Bolivia is really very difficult to access to justice. And not only we have this high crime and a slow and unreliable judicial systems, but those affect different groups in very different way. If you are poor, you are affected by high crime much more than if you are rich. In general, we have low state capabilities, even if they have improving, and what I will call a growing erosion of. Uh, democratic institutions. And here you have the Economist Intelligence Unit board ranking about different uh, democracies in Latin America. And you can see how clearly we have four regimes, Haiti, Nicaragua, Cuba, and Venezuela, that can only be defined as authoritarian regimes. And as full democracies, we only have Uruguay and Costa Rica. I don't want to be negative. This looks better than 30, 40 years ago, but there's still much work to do. And unfortunately, we seem to be slipping down a little bit. So let me stop over here. You will notice that there are a few more slides and in this uh, deck. And what we have decided to do is the following. If we run out of time, and as I have run out, we are going to record videos on our own and we will post them on the web page. Those videos will include, in the case of Latin America, a lot of further historical discussion about poverty and inequality, about when did Latin America fall behind in terms of income per capita, and about the importance of economic history. Those are complementary videos. We invite you, of course, 
to watch them and I think that will enhance the quality of your experience, but they are voluntary and I don't want to everyone to just have to focus way too much on these ideas. So let me stop over here, let me stop the share and maybe let Fernando ask some of the questions that we have in the Q&A. Hi, thank you, Jesus. Because of lack of time, well, first of all, thank you very much for all of your questions. There were many, but because of lack of time, we could not choose all of them. So I kind of made a compendium of the most common asked questions. So the first one is, what are the reasons for the fertility decline in Latin America and how it compares with the rest of the world? Okay, that's a great question. Actually, Ivan Luzardo and I are trying to write a paper about it. So uh, reason number one, I think that the whole world is having less children now than in the past. Um, this, I think, is very linked with what economists call uh, the skill premium. Being educated is more important than ever. Educating your children is very costly, both in terms of money and in terms of effort. So families are choosing to have less children and spend more time and effort educating them. And you see that all across Latin America, for instance, enrollment in high school and enrollment in universities is going up a lot. I think that in Latin America case, in addition, we have the problems linked with the stagnation over the last 10 years, 15 years. So you have on one hand a supply issue. We want to have more educated children and a demand issue. We have less ability to um, uh, raise our children because of the economic problems. In terms of uh, comparison with the other parts of the world, the foreign fertility is much faster that in other areas of the world. So if you compare, as I was saying before, how fast fertility has dropped in Guatemala and Honduras, it's a whole new game. Countries have not gone. So Honduras, I think, or Guatemala, one of the two, was nearly four children per woman in 2010, and now they are at two. We have never seen that. We have never seen countries dropping from four to two in 12 years. Okay? And that, I think, is, is something that we should really keep in mind. Second question, language homogeneity sounds like an advantage. Why has it paid off in terms of political unity, regional integration, and also economic growth? Okay, okay, thanks. That's actually one thing that I have on my table. Uh, one of the research projects that I want to, um, to do, and by the way, I'm going to throw a lot of ideas just because I, I say, I thought about it. Don't feel bad about just stealing the idea and using it for your own pitch dissertation on your own job market paper. I, I have way too many ideas, so I feel free to use them. One of the areas of research that I think we can work on is try to understand a little bit better the political economy of why Brazil was unified and, Latin, and the Spanish-speaking America was not. And again, in, in Brazil, if you're not from Brazil, you may not know that there were a lot of civil wars in the 19th century. Rio Grande wanted to be an independent nation, and it couldn't be an independent nation. And I don't think at this moment, as economists, we have terribly good political economy models of why that happened. And I think that will be the source of many, many great job market papers. Why Latin America could not, or at least the Spanish-speaking Latin America, could not keep unity, despite the obvious fact that I think it's so, you know, you're a Mexican and you bump into an Argentinian, the fact that we can speak the same language with uh, surprisingly homogeneous language, uh, just with a little bit of a different accent, did not ever produce uh, unification, political unification. An addendum to that is also about the urbanization, which also seems like a plus, but why has not been paid off? Uh, yes. Um, well, I think that the, the problem with urbanization was that for the longest time, urbanization is great if you have good state capability. So you're a Hong Kong, you're a Singapore, and you can really take advantage of the enormous returns to high urban agglomeration that economists have documented. So having a very large city like Hong Kong, if you actually run the state properly, is a great idea. Having a big city like Lima, when in the 1980s, Peru was not able to supply even basic uh, civ uh, civic services is not that great. Okay? And this is still the case. You go to Rio, you go to Sao Paulo, it really has huge areas with very, very bare minimum um, public uh, services. I think why urbanization has not given the right returns is weak state governance and weak state capability. Thank you. 
And again, trying to understand why Latin America has not been able to invest more on state capability is a, is a fundamental topic of research that I invite everyone to think about it more carefully. Particular question is, what is the name of the Australian historian who coined the term tyranny of distance? Oh, and, yes. And I think the concept might apply to periods before the 20th century. Yes, so the, the name, oh, I don't remember from the top of my head, it's in my, over here, let me see if I can find the book. <laughs> Sorry, I wake up. Um, well, I, I cannot find it now, but I'll, I'll, I'll tell you later. But if you put on, on, on Google, the tyranny of, dice, of distance, economic history of, Latin, of Australia, it will be the first hit. And yes, I, I actually thought about a lot about it um, when I visited Chile a few years ago. Chile is really very far away from the rest of the world. <laughs> it took me many, many hours to get to Chile from Pennsylvania, from Philadelphia. So it really made me think that the tyranny of distance in the absence of modern uh, transportation systems should have shaped Latin America history in ways that are under study. And even today, the fact that it's very easy for me to jump into a plane here in Philadelphia and be in London in a few hours, while going from Philadelphia to Santiago will take so long, it still matters. Was Latin America ever a manufacturing center? Or has the region always been dependent on producing primary goods? Well, that's part of the story we are going to tell later. But I think the answer is yes and no. <laughs> what I mean by that is there is a tradition, a historiographical tradition, that has emphasized that Latin America has not been a big producer of industrial and manufacturing goods. But I think that historiographical tradition sometimes has exaggerated the point a little bit. There has been more industry and more manufacturing that we suspect. And even at the time of the colony, there were quite a bit of manufacturing. In Later in the 50s and the 60s of the last, last century, there was a lot of production of stuff. Of course, it was never the United States. It was never the United Kingdom. So I will say not as little as sometimes people argue, but not as much as perhaps it will have been better for the region. Is there a gender lens in our perspective of the economic history of Latin America? As far uh, as I know of the, the, the people that is asking, from structural adjustment programs in the 80s and 90s to current urbanization and informality, gender division of labor is key to understand economic trends and shifts in the region. Yes, so we are going to try to, um, you know, to the extent that we have time in, in, 10, in 10 lectures to highlight gender issues, if you notice, I had a graph where I uh, talk about informality and how informality has a clear gender aspect. And again, it's an area where I think much deserves to be, uh, to be done. And I think that on Thursday, our lecturer, I, I was looking at her slides and our lecturer, our lecturer has a lot of uh, discussion precisely about gender issues and hopefully that, uh, that will be sufficiently prominent. Um, I think that especially in a structural adjustment programs in the late, in the 1980s, we were not, economists were not fully aware of these gender implications. And I think we are a little bit better now, but I hope we can continue improving and design economic programs that are, 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 are more equitable in terms of gender issues. In fact, part of the reason why I think coming back to one of the previous questions, why fertility is falling so fast in Latin America, perhaps in some sense a little bit too fast, is precisely still because of the gender inequalities that uh, Latin America is still encounters. So uh, uh, a better approach towards gender policies will certainly help Latin America along many, many dimensions. The Colombian government is currently trying to make an energy transition. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's feasible? Well, um, I don't know the details of the energy transition that the program and that the, go that the Colombian uh, uh, government has put forward. Uh, I have been thinking about energy transition in the context of other countries. Yes, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's obvious given when you look at the data that we need to transition to net zero emissions. Uh, and this is a complicated, uh, it's a complicated program. Yes, this morning, the European Parliament passed legislation prohibiting the sale of internal combustion engines by 2035. 
So you will not be able to buy a gasoline car. So we need to think about ways in which by 2050, all Latin Americans should be able to drive cars that do not pollute, that do not uh, issue CO2. And this is going to be very difficult. And it's going to be very difficult. Why? Because it's, this is much easier to do when you are Norway and you are very rich than when you are uh, El Salvador and you are not particularly rich country. So I, I, I wish I knew a little bit more about the, um, the Colombian government. I think it's feasible, but it's going to be costly. And one needs to, and this is where economists can play a difference. I think that it, uh, the, the comparative advantages of economists is being able to do the numbers and think in a sober and objective way about how to do this. From the perspective of Latin America, since I look at Angel over there, who is from Venezuela, uh, I will be a little bit more concerned about, you know, if the whole Venezuelan economy is around oil and no one is going to use oil in 2040 because we are transitioned to net zero emission, what is going to Venezuela going to do in 2040? And I think that Colombia also exports quite a bit of oil these days, no, Ivan? So in that sense, you know, that, that's an issue for, for Colombia if, if one of your main exports is going to, to a very large extent, disappear. How much indigenous resistance has shaped the economic history of Latin America? And oh, do you see yeah. any resurgence of the resistance in the current dynamics of the region? Um, well, that's one of the things I think that uh, you are going to discuss in a little bit more of, of detail. Yes, we uh, there is, as I was mentioning before, an interaction between resistance and what I call accommodation. Uh, it's a much more complex, the, the relation between European settlers or Spanish and Portuguese and indigenous people is a much more nuanced and complex history that anything has really told or that we were telling in the past. And that certainly shaped in decisive ways the political economy of Mexico or Peru. I mean, the, the whole process of independence of Mexico and Peru is very different from the process of independence in Argentina or Uruguay, precisely because of the importance of indigenous people. And that has, uh, we are going to see later how this is going to have enormous and fundamental impact during the 1950s and the 1960s during the process of, uh, for instance, uh, agrarian reform. And yes, throughout the region these days, uh, there is a cleavage of political structures that is based on, a, on, on, on ethnicity. And that's something that should be part of our conversation. How important are political elites in creating stable governments? And do you think if the disconnection between them created the political division in the 19th century? Oh, I think it's, it's absolutely a fundamental part of the story that we hope to be, to be able uh, to tell. Um, you know, it's not, we are not going to 100% follow the views of Athemoglu and Jim Robinson, although Jim Robinson is given a, a guest lecture of the division between inclusive and extractive institutions. But I think it is the case that many Latin American countries were not able in the 19th century, or the elites of Latin American countries were not able to create very inclusive institutions. And that has had a long run consequences that we still live until until this day and you know if i had a little bit more time we could discuss a little bit more exactly what that happened but yes i i fully agree and i hope that some of these ideas will pop out i'm pretty sure that jim robinson is going to talk about them during his presentation and one last question that kind of summarizes a lot of them so there has been a lot of people asking about the south korean argentina graphs mm -hmm. so why globalization work for South Korea and not for Argentina or for the rest of the world? Okay, so I, I don't want to I don't want to get too much ahead. You know, this is like when you are watching a crime movie and you know the you see the person being killed and you don't want to tell until the end. I think that uh, South Korea understood better that Argentina or many other countries the importance of export-led growth. Uh, Argentina emphasized much more import substitution. Uh, I think that South Koreans also uh, understood much better the importance of education and within education, in particular, primary and secondary education. One thing that has been a problem for many Latin American countries, even today, is that there are actually a fair amount of resources spent on education, but a lot of them go to universities and to top universities, which is every country. And South Koreans were much more aware that it's very, very important to give everyone at least six years of good education that to have yet one more PhD. And um, the third thing um, that I think is very, very important is South Korea had a much more keen awareness 
of the importance of good business environment, like secure property rights, good uh, judicial systems, etc. You know that if you sign a contract in South Korea, the contract is going to be enforced. If you sign a contract in Argentina, well, yeah, you know, you you pray for the best. <laughs> you hope for the best, and uh, you know, I, I I know it because it's not that very different from Italy or, or Spain in in Western Europe in comparison with Germany. So I will say this basically these uh, three things. First of all, being aware that the future was through exports, not through import substitution. Two, an emphasis on educating the population and in particular being sure that 100% of, of the population had good basic education. And three, creating the right business environment. So it's a mix of good market-oriented policies, but also good social policies. And uh, I, I know it's 12.30. I don't want to keep anyone going, but I'm happy to go for five, 10 more minutes if there is still a few more questions. Uh, but, but I don't want to force anyone to stay over here. I don't want to force Felipe or Ivan or Angel to, to stay over here, but I'm happy to, to go for five more minutes. And I also know the interpreters, they, they, they are not supposed to stay, so that's okay. I can answer the questions in Spanish myself. Okay, yeah, there are many questions more. We, we can keep on if the interpreters want to leave. So unfortunately, I mean, a lot of the questions are in English, so maybe we can continue in English. Okay, that's fine. So uh, has the economic protectionism slowed in the end of the 19th century or it did increase and why? Okay. So the protectionism increased in the late 19th century. It's in the graph in the slides. And I think part of the story was a lot of the people who make good money from exports. So imagine that you have a sugar plantation in or a coffee plantation in some Latin American country and you made good money in the late 19th century. So you turn around and you say, what I'm going to do with this money? Well, let me open a factory, okay? And I don't know, I'm going to have like a factory for some light industry, some light industrial goods, some light consumer goods. So what I do is then, since I'm part of the elite, after all, I'm the owner of the sugar plantation or the coffee plantation, I go to the, um, to the government, which, by the way, maybe myself or my brother, <laughs> and I tell them I want protection. And I think that a lot of that protection came precisely contrary to what the standard historical narrative is. It was not because the exporters didn't want protection. It was because the exporters wanted to have protection for the new round of investments financed by the profits from exports. According to Bertola Anocamp Anocampo, yeah. we can study Latin America as one region, mostly because the waves of industrialization and economic movements are very similar. Other economists affirm that we cannot study as one region. What do you think about this? Uh, on this one, I tend to be more with Ocampo. I think it's, it's one region. Look, everything is diverse. Everything has nuances. But at least for me, trying to think in a coherent way of the experience all the way from Mexico to Chile helps me. And I'm not going to claim, look, this is not like in physics. There is In physics, there is a right and there is a wrong answer. Here, this is more of a judgment call. But to me, the fact that both Mexico and Chile or Mexico and Argentina share a presidential system tells me a lot. And that goes even beyond industrialization and tells me a lot about the political economy of this country, tells me a lot about their social structures, tells me a lot about their economic policy. And that's why I think at the end of the day, it's a good idea to study this region jointly, although, you know, it's a judgment call. And, and I recognize that. How accurate would it be to say that the commodity dependence in the region has been detrimental, not only because of the stunted economic growth in times of yeah. low commodity price, but also because the benefits of when it was booming have not added to the economic well-being of the general population. Okay, so that's, that's one of the big elephants in the room. My view of the world is that being a commodity exporter is neither good nor bad in itself. It's what do you do with it? Okay? And, you know, let me tell you a commodity exporter that people don't have in mind, Denmark. What, what is the economic history of Denmark? Basically, Denmark exports pigs, eggs, and milk to the United Kingdom. That's what Denmark has been about. Okay, they have farms and they, you know, they have pigs and they have bacon and eggs and, and milk. 
And Denmark became, I think, a lot of people will argue, is the most successful society that history has ever known in terms of democracy and in terms of um, social equality and gender equality and, the, and pretty much being a commodity exporter. And yes, Denmark suffered the problem of price fluctuations, but the Danish elites during the 19th century were able to take an, an opportunity, which is being a commodity exporter, and transform it into the foundations of a fantastic society in comparison with all other societies. And to some extent, that's the case of uh, Australia or Canada. So it's not that you're a commodity exporter that kills you, it's what you do by being a commodity exporter. And I think that's part of the story we want to tell in this course. Going back to the colonial era, is it true that the Spanish coming to the region were mainly male? And if that is so, what were the consequences? Well, the consequences is that you walk through Mexico City and you see a lot of people of mixed race. <laughs> yes, so there was a big bias towards male immigration. And some of the consequences is this, what I was mentioning before, kaleidoscopic mix of races and cultures and that you can see in countries like Mexico, that you can see in countries like uh, Colombia or Venezuela or or. or, or or Brazil. And, you know, from the very beginning, Cortés, after conquering um, Tenochtitlan, marries a local princess. And that's going to be part of the story that I think you are going to tell about indigenous resistance slash accommodation and the very complicated stories of that uh, Latin America has with its own ethnic past. In terms of comparing Portugal and Spain and its colonies, could you say that maybe Spain and its colonies are more urbanized than Portugal and Brazil? Yes, that's, that's the case. Yes, that's, that's definitely the case that I was mentioning before that uh, when I was saying that it was a lot of emphasis of the Spanish in setting up cabildos and municipios that look like what they have left behind in Spain. The big boom of urbanization in Brazil only comes when the court moves from, moves from Lisbon to Brazil. Um, during the Napoleonic invasion, and they settled down in Rio. And then Sao Paulo is much later with the big mining boom and, and, and the coffee and the coffee and the coffee boom. So yes, the, the urban bias is a little bit more Spanish than Portuguese, but even today, Brazil is an enormously urbanized country. I mean, Rio and Sao Paulo are two gigantic metropolis, given the size of Brazil, a little bit larger than one will expect. Early on on the lecture, you talk about the term Latino. Mm -hmm. Is that referring to Spanish Portuguese born people or are we including mestizo people as well? Okay, so, well, the, the issues I was mentioning before is that it's a, it's a made up name. <laughs> so like everything that is made up depends a little bit on what you think about it. So in the 19th century, when people will refer to someone as Latin American, they will mean someone Spanish or, or Portuguese. By 1950, when someone says Latin American, they will include everyone that is indigenous. And that's why I was saying it's such a funny name, because exactly why an actual speaker <laughs> from, from, from Mexico should be called Latino, to me, has always been a little bit of a fascinating paradox. Or why a Quebecois that speaks perfect French, well, as perfect French as Quebecois speak, will not be called a Latino. A Latin is, is something that is, again, quite fascinating. It's a, as I, what I try to do during the first uh, 10 minutes is to highlight that the names we refer to things are social constructs, and that as all social constructs, there are tensions inherent to them that we need to be aware of. Great. Uh, so one last question now. Yeah. Returning to the future. So in Latin America... <laughs> is seeing a democratic crisis and preference for anti-status anti quo political parties. Is this unique to Latin America? Is this a result of inequality and colonial heritage? Okay, so first of all, polarization and um, uh, political polarization and instability is happening all across the world, okay? It's happening in France, it's happening in Germany, it's happening in Spain, it's happening all across the world. What happens with Latin America is that all these crises tend to be an order of magnitude larger, okay? So you have a little bit more polarization in Germany, so you go from five to 10. In Latin America, you go from five to 25. And I think that in my own reading of the current situation, 
part of this democratic backlash comes from the unhappiness of much of the population of saying, look, we have not grown since 2008. Okay, you have had 15 years where uh, the economy has not grown. And, and if I were, so imagine I were, I'm going to use the male example, but you know, I could be perfectly a female, but imagine I was a student, uh, let me say in Peru, that I did what I was supposed to do. Okay, so I was a good student in high school and I went to my local university and I study and I got my grades and I graduated from university and now I'm trying to get a good job. And there are not a lot of good jobs in Lima right now because the economy is stagnated. I will be very unhappy. I will say, you know, someone in some sense has stabbed me in the back. I did what I was supposed to do. And society is not, not offering me the, 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 the opportunities that I think I deserve and he deserves. So, of course, this is a person who is going to be unhappy and is going to generate political tensions. So addressing both a low economic growth and inequality is not only important from an economic perspective. I think it's important also from a political perspective to have good, prosperous societies. Well, thank you everyone for attending this first lecture. We will have Dr. Adriana Reaza on Thursday, and I will be uploading this video in the coming days, or already edited. And well, thank you. See you next time.